listening to Seeking Refuge, a podcast sharing the human stories of refugees. Our guest for this week is Jean Sicarella of the nonprofit organization Mission de Caridad. Your host for this week is Isha Hegde. Hi, everyone. My name is Isha, and on this episode of Seeking Refuge, I had the privilege to speak to Jean Sicarella, one of the co founders of Mission de Caridad, an organization helping asylum seekers in border cities between the United States and Mexico. This interview really opened my eyes to a humanitarian crisis occurring right by the United States. In season four, we're really focusing on the intersections, hence the name, of problems that refugees and asylum seekers face. And this episode in particular was really eye-opening to the everyday situational issues, health issues, and settings that affect so many asylum seekers and refugees today. I hope you guys enjoy listening. Thank you for tuning in to our new season. My name is Isha, and today I'm so excited to speak with Jean Sicarella, who's representing her organization, Mission de Caridad. Thank you so much for joining me. So, can you tell me a little bit more about your organization? Yeah, so Mission de Caridad was formed in order to help women and children, refugees, migrants, and vulnerable populations that find themselves in Mexico on the U.S. border and needing assistance. So they can't necessarily get into the United States, but yet they find themselves living in dire poverty and needing assistance. So our organization was formed in order to give them the skills and assistance that they need to live independently and self-sufficiently in Mexico. So again, like the organization was formed to let these people live in Mexico, not within the United States, correct? So right along the border? Yes. Yeah, because the reality is, you know, every year the United States sets what's called a refugee ceiling. These are the number of people that they're going to allow into the United States. So for this year, 2021, it set at 11,814. It's actually a number that carries over from 2020. It gets reset in like October. So it's about 11,000. The year before 19 was like 30,000, 22,000. So they're historic lows with the Trump administration. The 2021 level that starts in October has already been set to exceed. I think it's going to be like 121,000 or so. Wow. But the reality is that only between 2% and 8% of those from Latin America actually get admitted to the United States and actually get asylum. So that being said, that leaves a whole lot of people stuck and not able to get asylum. So our job is really we have our work cut out for us, right? Because there are people that may want asylum, Maybe they don't qualify. Maybe there's other circumstances. The refugee ceiling I gave you is worldwide. And so people need assistance. They imagine you fled your country. It was a horrible situation. You're fleeing violence and persecution, and you come seeking refuge, but you can't get the refuge you need. Mm -hmm. And so our job is to help them where they are, in this case on the border, on the Mexico side. So really like following up from that, what led you to, you know, start this organization aside from the problem? Like what let you, led you to take action um, and start Mission de Caridad? It's interesting because taking action is always the hardest thing, right? Because in the world, there are so many problems. And my philosophy is you have to start somewhere. If you never start, you never solve anything. So there was this little piece of Mexico that I had experience with. I had people that I knew. I'd gone on a missions trip there before. I had kept contact with them. And during the Trump administration, some things happened on the border. We're not a political organization, but there are some uh, realities of certain administrations and policies. And one of the policies was called metering, where people would come to the border, but they couldn't actually seek asylum. They had to wait in line. And that line was many months long. So women and children made it all the way to the border. They wanted to seek asylum, but they couldn't, not legally. And so they would wait in the town in which we serve people, in San Luis, Rio, Colorado, and Sonora, Mexico. So people would find their way there, but they would be in line for maybe three months, four months. I just spoke to a family with COVID uh, who has been waiting for almost two years. Um, So, you know, the the need is really real where they are. And so my co-founder and I, Francisco Ortega, he lives in San Luis, Rio, Colorado, Mexico. 
he was seeing this happen firsthand. And we both felt like we needed to do something about it. We felt like there was a need and we thought we could come together and solve that need. So I'm actually in Boston. Mm -hmm. He's in Mexico. We meet on a multiple times a week and I go down to Mexico now about every other month. And the goal is to work together in order to solve this. So we've grown a pretty decent sized organization. Wow, so you're all the way in, but I'm, I know you mentioned you were in Boston. That is such a like huge separation and sacrifice that you make. So that's amazing. So you said you go down to Mexico at least once a month. For how long? Um, I go, I've been going every other month. And with COVID, that put a gap, right? For a few months, like I last time I had gone was March. And then I didn't get to go again until November. Um, and that was because of the pandemic. It was just not feasible to travel. Mm -hmm. Um, I usually go for a week, but it really depends on what kind of business I have there. So I'd say probably most of the time it's seven to 10 days that I'm there. Um, it will probably be a little bit different this summer. And now that we're building our facility, it probably will need to be for longer stretches of time. And are you building the facility in, like you said, in the same area, in the same town that you visit in Mexico and what's going to be involved in the facility? Like, is it, um, mainly going to be housing or is it like healthcare as well or what's going into um, building that and what's going to be a part of that? Yep, that's a great question. So in order to lift someone out of poverty, you need to think about the whole person, right? So what keeps people in poverty? Well, a lot of times it's a lack of education, a lack of a job, right? They can't earn an income sufficient enough to get out of poverty. Sometimes it's social and emotional issues that they need to deal with the trauma that they faced because of their situation that got them there in the first place, not understanding how to manage their money. So we're looking at the end, their health, right? Their physical health and well-being, not eating well, not having sufficient food available to them. Those are all barriers for someone to be able to live independently or escape poverty. So we're looking at the whole person. So the way to do that is to start by understanding what their job needs are. Can we teach them a skill that maybe instead of being a farm worker and earning $35 a week, mm -hmm. perhaps they could actually do something that could earn them more money. Instead of being a brick maker, maybe we can take that skill of making brick into something else that could be helpful to them. At the same time, many of the people we work with can't read and write. So if we could provide them with some basic education or even still their children, and get their children enrolled in school. You can think of one girl who she's 14 and she has to work in the fields to feed her and take care of her family. So you can see the writing on the wall for her, right? If she's a farm mm -hmm. worker at 14, how will she escape poverty earning 35 to $40 a week inconsistently, right? She won't. And so if we could supplement the income of their family, take her out of that situation of having to work, give her some educational skills, she may still need to work to support her family, but she can get a better paying job and that better paying job may be able to lift her out of poverty. Mm -hmm. So I haven't answered your question. Go ahead. And, you know, not only that, but once you start educating children who may be the first in line for their families to have the privilege of getting an education, I think it really gives them confidence as well, um, you know, to take on some of these challenges because I feel like, and I think this is, you know, what you were saying, but if you're surrounded by people in similar situations, you end up grouping yourself in those similar situations. And I think, you know, what you guys are doing in the case of specifically that 14 year old girl, I think it'll really give her a new perspective. And, you know, she has the freedom to capitalize on that perspective. So that's really empowering as well. Yeah, imagine, you know, we are where we are for where we were born or the opportunities that were provided to us. And for many of us, that wasn't something that we chose. We may have chose to take advantage of our education, but we had the opportunity to do it. These are people that don't actually have the opportunity. So there's even a hopelessness, right? When you live in a home where you don't really have electricity or running water, where your bathroom is an outhouse, you know, it, it limits you. You can't even be dressed enough to even interview for a job. You know, you don't even have a shower or a facility or clothing because you can't afford it. So it's like a perpetual issue, right? You, you have to solve some of these problems to get people to a point where then they can take the next step in their lives. And so our facility is going to provide multiple things. It's going to provide a place where we're going to be training women in skills that they can take and use to earn a better income. And that's gonna look like either working within our facility, making a product, 
that we're going to sell through an e-commerce solution and locally or providing workforce training so that women can then take that and work somewhere else. It's mm -hmm. also going to have a preschool component for school readiness for younger children so the women can work. At the same time, it's going to tap a facility or, or space for girls like Lily, who they need a little bit more education, right? So we're not, we're not a school. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do in the cases of students like Lily and also elementary age students is we're going to provide the resources they need to attend school. What stops them from attending school? In Lily's case, we need to provide income to the family. In the case of uh, uh, this other girl, Donna, who's eight years old, well, she needs money to attend school because she has to pay for her uniform and her books and transportation. The person that she's living with can't provide that, so she's not able to go to school. So the more that we can help break down the barriers of what prevents children from getting educated, the more we can get them in the school system. Once they're in the school system, then we can provide the tutoring, the holes in their education. We can provide after-school enrichment and a support system for them to be able to take advantage of the education that they're able to access now. And are you guys like partnered with um, local schools as well? That is our plan. So because of COVID, you know, our facility is not built. So Friday, we got word that finally our facility can transfer to us. Mm. So that was amazing. I mean, I'm still in disbelief because that's been two years in waiting. Um, but what we've been doing is equally as important. We've been providing humanitarian aid to these communities. Mm -hmm. So we deliver healthy groceries to families in need. There's no mistake in the need. People say, well, how do you pick them? Well, you drive into a community and you see people with outhouses and houses with no windows that are made of, of wood, you know, scrap wood. Mm -hmm. And there's no mistake in that you've gone into a community that needs your assistance. They're in pockets through the areas that we serve in Mexico. And so we deliver these healthy groceries. And while we're doing that, we're giving them two weeks worth of food. And we're talking like milk and fruits and vegetables and lean meats, things that really break the barrier of what we typically see with people delivering to people in poverty. Usually it's like rice, beans, canned goods. You know, these are fresh vegetables that we all would love to eat. Because what we want to do is serve people with dignity. They should have the same fresh vegetables that we do. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't be relegated to canned foods just because no one can deliver it. So we deliver that those healthy groceries and necessities to them. Cleaning products, masks, clothing, blankets when it's cold. So we deliver these things to them. And while we're doing that, we're building trust in the community that we're serving. And so the good news of COVID in this case is that we've been had the last almost year to build trust. So people know who they are. They trust us. Now, as we're building the facility, not only will they have a vested interest in seeing it be built, but they're going to want to participate in it because they know us mm -hmm. and they feel like we have their best interest at heart. And, you know, when we were talking earlier and looking at your website as well, I feel like you guys serve or are focusing on serving mainly women and children. Those are the people that you encounter. What further difficulties do women and children face in these situations? Or what are some obstacles that they're put against besides just, you know, education like we focused on? Yeah, well, the first thing with a woman that has a child is the need to care for her children. So that first and foremost limits her ability for employment. So frequently what we see is women taking their children to work. So mm -hmm. what that might look like is working in the street selling flowers or working cleaning and while they're cleaning their child is sitting there mm -hmm. right so a lot of children have nothing to do while their mothers work or they're left alone it is not infrequent that we'll go to deliver groceries and we'll find the kids alone in the home or or they're within the community so they're kind of wandering around there's other adults around in other homes but no one's really caring for them in the way that we might think of caring for a child and making sure that they're safe Mm -hmm. These aren't the safest environments either. You know, extension cords can be strung from one house to another. You know, there's there are a lot of environmental effects. There's stray dogs. There's glass in the street. You know, if there's, there's extreme heat in the summer. It can be 120 degrees, so we're talking heat stroke. So there's a lot of things that women face that might be unique for them. That if they had a man, well, at least there's two people. Um, so that's one. The other is they're... they're uh, vulnerable to exploitation in a lot of different ways by their employer, by somebody that might be targeting them and might target them with promises of something better, maybe passage to the U.S. or someone that will care for them. And they can find themselves being um, 
sucked into, for lack of a better word, sex trafficking, Mm -hmm. because all of a sudden they just didn't realize what they were getting into. Um, So there's just a lot of ways that women are vulnerable. You know, imagine for a moment, and this is for our listeners too, imagine being in a situation where you really don't have anybody and somebody comes alongside you seeing that you're vulnerable. Maybe they've been watching you for a while and they realize that this person is vulnerable and they approach you and they act like they're your friend and Mm -hmm. they may seem like they are, but at the end of the day, they don't have your best interest at heart. Um, And you're desperate. You're grasping at straws. You're barely struggling yourself or surviving yourself. And so those, that's why women and children, because they are the most vulnerable of everyone. And, you know, with these instances of, you know, sadly trafficking, do you mainly see younger girls? And by younger, I mean, you know, teenaged girls being um, sucked into these, you know, promises or lured into this dangerous trafficking industry? Or is it also equally women with children, you know, middle-aged women? I can't say specifically, but I can tell you that it's it's all over the map. You know, someone that's vulnerable does not discriminate on age. Mm -hmm. Um, I will tell you that many of the women we see, especially the refugees coming from other areas, are very young. You know, they may be, you know, 22 and they already have three or four children, 25 and they already have many children. So they are extremely young, younger than we might see in the United States, for example. And how are they traveling? Do you do you know how they are traveling to your location and how far they are coming from? So is it locally in a radius from the area that you guys are working or is it, you know, from miles or hours away? People come from all over. So we met people from Cameroon on the border. And you might say, oh, my gosh, how did you get there? Yeah. Well, you know, when you're fleeing violence, when you're fleeing for your life, you look to escape to wherever you think you can find hope. And so for people, you know, when you need to fly into another country, that's a lot harder to do. You need visas and you need certain things to be able to travel. Well, to cross the border in Mexico, you can cross by foot. So if you can get yourself there, then there's a hope to present at the border. And so a lot of times people will come from very far, hundreds and hundreds, or in this case, thousands of miles away, And they make their way a lot of different ways. Many people walk. It takes them months to get there. Maybe they have enough to catch a bus some of the way. And the journey walking is not a safe one because a lot of them are targeted. They take the same roads. And so many times they have to pay a fee to walk on these roads because they're Mm -hmm. being targeted by people that own public roads, right? And so in that particular case, women can be extremely vulnerable. You see these large caravans coming. Right? But a caravan doesn't necessarily mean that you're safe because you're traveling in a group of people because oftentimes within those caravans are also people that are unsafe. So here you feel like you have safety, but you really don't. So some of the stories we hear when women arrive is that they have been abused and have been subject to some kind of abuse along the way or they hide at night in the field and hopefully they can join back up with the caravan when the sun rises. You know, just things that they need to do in order to keep themselves safe. But they're traveling over the course of months, not days. Mm -hmm. But other people, I mean, some people have means. So some people have enough money to get to the border and they might be able to take a bus or a train or or whichever way to get there. There's no train per se that gets you right to the border, but it could take you a certain way from depending on where you're coming from. And are those people with the means, you know, to reach the border in the minority? Oh, yeah. That they're in the minority. And many people come from Central America. Mm-hmm. And they come to the border with nothing. That it's it's just shocking, you know, when you mentioned the individual from Cameroon and even, you know, people from the rest of Central America, you know, coming up towards this not just unknown region, but unknown country to them is insane in hopes of freedom and, you know, liberties from the situation that they're in. And I think we focused a little bit on the pandemic earlier, or it was mentioned, how has the pandemic shifted life for your organization and for those who need your help? For those at the border during the pandemic, it's been extremely difficult. So pre-pandemic, there were 60,000 plus people on the border, all along the length of the border. And many of them disappeared because they knew that there was no way to get the United to the United States. And they can't wait at the border. You know, there's mm-hmm. no like support for them to wait. The shelter, many of the shelters shut down. 
So those that were in a shelter could stay and potentially could stay in a shelter. Others couldn't. So one family, for example, that I'm aware of, they came from El Salvador. They, are, they left El Salvador in October of 2018. They made it to the border and needed to wait. They finally got the opportunity and came up on the list, but then COVID hit. And they had their hearings, but then their hearings kept getting delayed. They were in a shelter. Their shelter closed in March of 2020, and they've been locked in for a year. So they have not been able to leave the shelter for a year. They have two children, younger children. Um, and so it's a mother, a father, a grandmother, and mm-hmm. two young children who have basically been locked inside for a year, unable to leave. Um, now they just learned that their asylum hearing has been granted. They will be able to come to the United States. This is the reality of the new administration. Some people are experiencing now some of these backlogs are being addressed. But the story doesn't end like that for many. And the story is very real for those that experience it, where imagine you made it all the way there. You're feeling like, finally, I made it. This is my hope. And then you learn there's something that you might not have known, like Mm -hmm. you can't get in because there's this backlog of people. Now there's a waiting list or you're somehow ineligible because of some kind of factor. Maybe you crossed illegally before and now you're not able to come in because that invalidates your ability to seek asylum. There's all kinds of reasons why it doesn't work for everybody. I met a woman from Honduras once. She was at the border. This was last year. And once she got to the border, she had heard about child separation. Mm -hmm. And then she said, I don't want to come to the United States. I don't want to lose my children. So now she made her way all the way to Honduras, from Honduras, to learn that, wait, I actually, my dream isn't my dream. I need to now create another life for myself. And that's where we might come in, right? Because now mm-hmm. this is what we do for a living, right? That's what Mission de Caridad does. It takes women like this and tries to create opportunities for them that they can live in Mexico because the United States may not be an option for them, either voluntary or involuntary. And for those people in shelters right now um, that COVID has you know, caused them to stay inside those shelters, is there any promise for what happens if they do leave that shelter? No, there are no promises at all for anything. There's no promise that they'll get asylum. There's no promise that they'll get the opportunity to seek asylum. There's no promise that they can stay in the shelter. I mean, it's just, it's a life of unknowns. And when you're traveling with your children, in this case, at least it's an intact family. Mm -hmm. But even imagine the disappointment. You finally get the hearing and then they continue it again. Or they, they don't let it occur because maybe something was missing. Maybe the interpreter didn't show up. Or, you know, there's just a million reasons why these don't end up happening for people. And it's extremely disappointing and discouraging. And it's unclear how the new administration is going to handle it. Right? There's, a, there's a very long backlog of asylum seekers. And there's ones that want to seek asylum that are just coming. And so mm-hmm. we can't process them all. We don't have the resources. So it's unclear how our current administration is going to is going to handle it. But you can see already it's all over the news, right? People that people don't want detention. Well, so what is the solution? You know, because if there's no detention, then they just come in. And I think that those are problems that we, as Mission de Caridad, don't have to solve. But certainly our leaders do need to solve. How are we going to handle the issue of immigration on this border? because it's a significant one and these are real people and many of them have escaped real danger. Yeah, and besides, I think you mentioned earlier that you know the woman from Honduras really had to reevaluate her entire separation because she learned that she could be separated from her child. What other instances are there where these asylum seekers, these refugees just have to turn around, you know, and realize that this isn't tangible? For them, how often does that happen, and what are some other situations that cause these refugees to just have to turn around? So I can't speak to how often it happens, but I can tell you that I have experienced it many times. Another woman we saw outside of a shelter. This shelter, you can only stay two days, and then you have to find your own way. And she had presented at the border. She lied, and it, she got found out. Right? She had actually crossed without papers before. And so now it invalidated her asylum case in this particular case, in this particular instance. And so she could not go to the U.S. So now she needs to figure out what she's going to do. Is she going to go back to her country? Is she going to try to make her own way in the city alone with her daughter? And it's unclear because you can't go to the shelter. So some people, what we see is 
groups of people will band together, right? People from a particular area and they'll rent an apartment. We saw 24 people living in an apartment one time. So it was two small rooms. It had one bathroom. It had no kitchen facilities. It was an extremely dangerous situation. They were paying, I think, above market rate because they were being uh, exploited, right, mm -hmm. for this apartment that really wasn't inhabitable. And it was a dangerous situation, but that's what that's the situation people find themselves in. You know, you need some kind of roof. You cannot sleep on the street. It's, yeah. it's just too dangerous. And... Um... You know, I like to ask everyone that I interview, I know we were talking about a couple of other stories that you had, but is there any particular story that really pops out to you that cemented your, you know, goal to help asylum seekers? Well, so there are so many stories. When I think of the children that I see and I see their potential, right? So I have this sort of thing when I look at children, even here in the States, and you know, you see certain kids and they have certain personalities. Well, I often wonder, how is that, how's God going to use your personality and to, and to help you change the world in some way? And I often see these children who really should be sad and depressed, don't even realize the situation they find themselves in. And so a lot of them do have a lot of joy and they seem, they appear happy, even though they have absolutely nothing in a barefoot and not wearing clothes that even fit them. Uh, but sometimes you see a personality in a child and you think this one could really make a difference. And there's this one little girl, her name is Shelly. And when we first met her, she was really shy. And each time we visit her, she gets more and more like bubbly and her personality shines through. And she's only I think she's probably about four years old. And she's the kind of girl, if given an opportunity at preschool, she probably will be one that could change the world with her personality. She probably could be a teacher, someone who cares about people, a lover of people, but she needs to be giving an opportunity to do that. Same as this girl, Lily, who works in the fields. You know, if given an opportunity as an education, how might she change her entire community? Mm -hmm. Because frequently, people in a particular community care for one another. When one is in need, everyone tries to come around and help that particular need. We deliver food. People are often like, oh, well, there's someone who lives like around the corner, down the street, you know, in the next block. Can you go deliver there too? You know, they frequently want to distribute the things that we, that we deliver to other people to help others. And so imagine if they are lifted up out of their situation, how that could lift an entire community out of their situation. So the stories go on and on, really. We were just talking about the fact that, you know, when one person is in need in a community, the entire community tries to lift that individual up and help them. But how do people native to this area who are not trying to seek asylum, who are just, you know, maybe your average middle class individuals in these areas, how do these individuals view these asylum seekers? And are they aware of the problems that are going on? Isha, that is a really excellent question. When you live in a border town and all of a sudden people just keep showing up in your town and you're already struggling, it's not even just middle class people, people who are even lower middle class or in poverty in these areas, they, they're not welcome. They don't necessarily open their arms and say, oh, great, come on in, right? They feel like, wait, there's not enough jobs for us. There's not enough food and resources mm -hmm. for us. And this is where we come in and where COVID, when you ask the question, well, how has COVID impacted your organization? It has somewhat stopped us in our tracks in the sense that we're not able to deliver programs on a large scale. But what it has helped us to do is build trust in the community by delivering food to the people that are there. And now if we can help the people that are local or the migrants that are local, not necessarily local, meaning they live there, but they found themselves there, right? Mm -hmm. And they're mixing within the community. And if we can build those communities together, then they will be able to receive people, right? Because they'll be in a better place themselves. But when you have a whole community of poverty and then you try to bring more people into poverty, I think it's really difficult for those that are already there to feel like, oh, come on in, yeah. you know, because they're struggling themselves. And so, yes, it is something that we have to fight against. And one way we fight against it is the fact that they're already serving people in the community. When they look at our organization, they don't look at us as just helping foreigners, just helping refugees. But in fact, we help local people as well. And that is extremely important to our survival because if the local community embraces us and wants to help us, then we're able to help everybody else. 
if the local community doesn't want us there, then that makes it really difficult to be there. And imagine even here in the States, right? If mm -hmm. someone, if a community doesn't want you there, they throw all kinds of barriers up, right? That's hard to get building permits, people vandalize your property, right? But when people want you there, well, everyone looks out for you. You know, all of a sudden people are looking out for people who are vandalizing your property. And that's a very real risk for us if we don't have community support. We could find our property vandalized. We could find ourselves at risk if we don't have the kind of support in the community that we're going into. And I know earlier we were mentioning the fact that these asylum seekers aren't just from um, Mexico or Central America even. You mentioned that there was an asylum seeker all the way from Cameroon. How do these international people or people from vastly different cultures adjust to the life there in Mexico? Um, because that seems like there's not only a, you know, cultural, cultural barrier, but a link, like a literal language barrier. Um, so how are those people adjusting and to life in these border towns and just life as asylum seekers without even knowing the language potentially? Yeah, yeah sure. That's an excellent question. And oftentimes when people come, they come in groups. So maybe only one or two come at first, but then others come. And I've seen the list of people that were waiting. And sometimes you see a huge list of people from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So there's like hundreds of people waiting for Nigeria or Cameroon or areas in Africa that I even wasn't even familiar with. But one of the success stories was a group of people from, from Haiti. So when they, when many people fled from Haiti, they came to Mexico. So now we have a group of people who don't necessarily fit into the community. And over time they have one of the ways is they prove to be a very hardworking community. And now in Tijuana, for example, there's a whole Haitian community of people who are there that are very well received. They're seen as hard workers. They're seen as a group of people who want to assimilate into the culture, not necessarily give up their own ways. They bring their own richness to the culture. They bring their own traditions and their own things. But at the same time, they have to be able to survive within the culture that they go into. And they've done that very well. And that's been a significant success story. And, you know, when I first got to Mexico, people always reference, reference the Haitians, you know, and I think it seems so racist, but I don't know, so like specific. Yeah. But yet over and over, no matter where I am along the border, people mention Haitians as a success story. And I think everybody along the border recognizes that this population has done really well and they recognize they couldn't go to the United States and doing very well where they were. And now this is a, a strong community. That's amazing. And I think when you mentioned that story earlier with that individual from Cameroon, I sort of thought of it as like a singular individual trying to assimilate themselves into, um, into this, you know, foreign society for them. But it is comforting in a way to know that these people can find themselves in groups and like the Haitians can add to the culture of the area that they're in and bring their own unique flair. I think that's maybe just shows their fighting spirit and a lot of the fighting spirit that these people do have from the perspective of someone who is very separated from the situation as a whole. And um, what do you feel are some essentials needed for refugees and asylum seekers? You know, it can be literal objects or it can also be more figurative needs such as education, access to, you know, healthy food like we were talking about. What are some of the essentials that you see these people um, needing? Mm. Well, so the first thing, I think it's just stability and safety, right? It's a place to be able to feel like they can survive safely. So just live, right? So it's, it's housing and a place to reside in some way, shape, or form. Um, when refugees come, they often don't have anything. And so being able to provide something for them is extremely helpful. One of the things that's been important to us and why we are in Mexico and Boston simultaneously is that it's important to understand the culture where you are in order to be able to serve, right? Because if I come in as a white woman from Boston, you know, a very affluent area, a very highly educated area, and then I try to... Um, go into an area of Mexico, not understanding the culture the way that I should, I can make a lot of mistakes. I can make a lot of assumptions. I could provide my own values and my own view into a culture. 
And so I really value the fact that we have a team in Mexico that understands the culture that is on the ground and that knows how to implement the things we need to implement. So that being said, one of the things that's really important to our organization is to provide necessities. So frequently you'll see organizations like at Christmas time come in and they bring toys and gifts. And, you know, when I look at how people live, that's not necessarily a gift to them. Mm -hmm. What really would do better is a pair of shoes. And kids are so grateful to even get a new pair of pants. For, for To us, that feels like that's, you know, not a gift. To them, that's like they've probably never had something new, certainly no time recently. And so to get a new jacket or a new pair of shoes or a pair of socks or ponytail holders, right, or a little pen light so they can have light in the darkness are all things that are gifts to them well over a truck or something else. Um, we are looking, actually noticing now that so many kids don't have shoes, really hoping that we can bring a truckload of shoes over. I also noticed that they don't have any balls. Like, I really want to deliver soccer <laughs> balls. I feel like, you know, that sounds frivolous, right? Not a necessity, but exercise is a necessity. A lot of kids are moving around. Obesity, they have, Mexico has the highest level of child and adult, child and adult obesity in the world. So a ball would allow a child to move and kick and run around and so I really feel like that could be something for kids to get exercise I was also thinking like wiffle balls and baseballs you know things that they can move because you have to run to get the ball mm -hmm. you know so things that don't take up a lot of space that can work because they have tons of space there are a lot of people live in the country mm -hmm. or a little bit outside of the city so those are some physical like things that people need you know clothing shoes you know of some some functional gifts mm -hmm. but on t and, and housing. But on top of that, it's actually an opportunity, an opportunity like we're trying to provide education, food to sustain. You, you can't get educated if you're not even eating healthy, right? So those are important factors, the health in order to be able to be whole, to then be able to take advantage of the things that are presented. So we as an organization, what do we need to do this? We need money. Mm -hmm. We need to be, or partnerships, right? So money is not everything. We need smart people, people that understand and have access to shoes that we can get yeah. or have access to organizations or foundations that, will, that are willing to support these kind of efforts. Mm -hmm. And so that's what helps us survive. Um, and we take help from anybody. We partner, we're partnering with the Immigration Coalition for Water for Farm Workers. You know, we have someone that's working on our team now that used to work at World Vision and used to wow. implement a lot of these programs that we're talking about. Um, and each of us comes with our own gift. And if we put those gifts together, there's no stopping what we can do. So at the beginning of, you know, that question that I asked, I'm sorry, this does not have to be chronological, but you stated oh, yeah. that, you know, you were a white, you're a white woman from Boston coming into this area of Mexico. How have you um, kind of adopted this Mexican culture or what were some of the initial difficulties that you had with um, you know adopting this Mexican culture or how have you tried to integrate it um, when you're visiting so what are some of the cultural barriers that you faced as someone who you know is trying to help these people in a culturally respective manner like you said you know you can't impart the knowledge and the lifestyle that you have coming from Boston to these people who are living in a completely different area. That's, that's so, that's, this is going to be a really, I think, interesting question for me to listen to as someone who wants to go into this field potentially. Hmm. So I'm going to answer the question in two parts. Yeah. So part one is I take a back seat. So I don't come in. It's my team that has the front seat. And I, I'm in the background. So people don't even recognize and I do not promote the fact that I'm a co-founder of this organization. So when I'm out serving, I may as well be any of the other people on the team. So that's kind of the first thing. But, you know, when you started to ask the question, I'm sure you could see me smile because I had to learn a lot. So I've been learning Spanish so I can speak Spanish now. That was not easy. Mm -hmm. Right. It took it's it take I practice every single day. There's not a day that passes that I don't practice speaking Spanish in some way, and yet I still have a huge long road ahead of me. Coming into an area as a single, uh, I'm married, but as I'm traveling alone as a mm -hmm. female, I have to be very respectful of the cultural norms as it relates to how women relate to men. Because I'm extremely friendly, and mm -hmm. I love to joke, 
And if I meet people that speak English, I am happy to like develop a relationship and, and just yeah. it's the way that I am. And I have to be really mindful of that when I'm dealing with maybe men, for example, in that culture, that my overly friendliness could be misconstrued for something else. Oh, and so okay. in some respects, I have to be maybe a little bit reserved and a little bit more cautious while I get to know people and they get to know me, mm -hmm. right? Because people are suspicious of me potentially, especially at first. Well, what, why is she here? Mm -hmm. What does she have to gain from this? And what they don't realize and what they know now, but they didn't know then is that I have no motivation. My motivation of doing this is love and care for another. It's believing that I have privilege just by where I'm born and mm -hmm. it's my job to actually do something about it. And so I feel like in that case that I'm responsible to, um, to do what little part that I can in order to make a difference. So again, these do not have to be chronological, but I have a question in here. So I'll, I can change it a bit if you don't mind. So mm -hmm. how do you think this experience of being an asylum seeker, being a refugee impacts you know, individuals born into this situation. So people who know nothing else besides this, you know, struggle of being an asylum seeker. Do you see a lot of individuals like that who are just, you know, born into this cycle of being an asylum seeker, being a refugee? I think we focused on this a bit at the beginning. Yeah, I'm going to define a couple of terms because I think that might be helpful. Mm -hmm. So a migrant is someone who moves from one place to another, especially in order to provide work or a better living condition, right? So a migrant is someone who's not necessarily escaping violence, but they could be escaping horrific situations of like poverty. Mm -hmm. There's certain areas in Mexico where the average education is fourth grade. So, you know, they're escaping an area that's extremely poor. We're a border town, so there are better jobs, a higher income. Okay. You know, so instead of earning a handful of dollars an hour, maybe they can get upwards into the over $5 an hour range, you know, as opposed to being two fifty dollars an hour. Um, and so a lot of people will move to an area for, for things like that. Seeking refuge is usually when you're escaping some kind of persecution or war or natural disaster. And those refugees show up and they often can't go back because what they've escaped is danger that they can't go back to or there's nothing left for them to go back to. Mm -hmm. Both of those populations have a very similar story as far as what they experience once they get there. Maybe what they came from looks a little different, but once they arrive where they've arrived, they have a similar story on the journey it took to get there and also what they have, which is virtually nothing. Mm -hmm. And so these children, it depends on their situation and what they came from. Some came from highly educated. So some kids were in school and they were schooled through eighth grade or ninth grade or even in high school, right? And they got displaced because their situation displaced them. Maybe their parents had great jobs and they were targeted by some kind of gang mm -hmm. that wanted to extort them. And in order to stay alive, they need to flee. And so those refugees are very, very different than a refugee that maybe left from a different area where they had a very low education. And so it it's all depends on where they came from. And it's very different. You know, I was at the border one time and I was talking to girls who had, they were high school graduates and actually some college education. And they were waiting and hoping to seek asylum in the U.S. because they have fled. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a very different situation. And for us, working with someone like that that already has a good foundation is extremely helpful in lifting up other people in the community. Because now perhaps they will stay in Mexico and they can use yeah. what they already know with some augmentation to be able to help some other people. And would you say those individuals are in the minority, those who... It is un an unfortunate situation for them, but it's extremely, um, you know, as again, someone who's separated from the situation, hearing that a lot of these people never had any other option, never, you know, had an education past even the eighth grade is extremely emotionally upsetting and off like eye opening to me because I feel like a lot of the people that I'm around and even myself you know I may view someone in this situation around my age and I may 
measure them up to my standards I may be like oh like they've been through high school they're in co and it's it's wild to me that they may never even have finished middle school which is an extremely different standard from my from my own and you know coming to that conclusion how do you think people like myself and many of the listeners of the podcast who are separated from this situation at the border who may not even have a clear idea about what's going on at the border right now, help those living through it every single day? So the first is compassion. Until you've walked in the shoes of another, it's hard to understand their situation. And there are times on my site, I'll see people post things like, don't let them in, or um, just things that what mother would send their child across the border alone, or what, what mother would bring their child to the border? right? And it would, would risk hundreds of miles of a journey. And my response is a mother in desperation, a mother that has nowhere else to turn. And for us to judge why she made that decision says that we don't understand the situation. Yeah, People's personal situations are complex. And for a mother to give up their child is probably one of the most sacrificial things a mother could do. And to watch her child in pain or to see the lack of opportunity for her child, one doesn't know what the mother or the family experience themselves and what they're hoping that they can get for their child. Mm -hmm. And keep in mind, there's lots of misinformation out there. I mean, I am sure that people just, some people just feel like, hey, if I could just get to America, right? I can get the American dream. And they don't realize that when they get here, their situation can be just as difficult or not worse because they had a perception of something that isn't reality. Um, so I think for a lot of people, it's not understanding the true picture of everything that's out there, those that don't understand the situation. So part of it is first putting on compassion and say, and understanding the privilege. If we're all listening to this podcast, we have privilege, right? We were probably born, in, born into a situation or we're given opportunities to get, get out of the situation we were born into, right? Many of us have experienced our own horrible things. That's what mm -hmm. probably causes us to be a little bit more compassionate. But we had a way to escape. And many of us can probably remember that person in our lives that gave us that opportunity or that said that one thing to us that helped us get over whatever hurdle it was. And what we want to do is help people to understand that that's what these people need. They need someone to extend a hand, extend an olive branch, extend an opportunity to help them succeed as well. So that these people, these children, these adults can actually escape poverty. Because when you live a life where you have no electricity or electricity coming from an extension cord and no running water in your home so that you're cooking outside and you're going to the bathroom outside, it is really hard to escape from that if there is no opportunity presented to you to escape. You cannot do it on your own accord. You cannot do it earning $32 a week. It's yeah. just that's not even enough to support your family. So even just emotionally, the emotional baggage that comes from being in that situation can prevent you from even trying to get ahead. So again, to go back to your question, what can people do here? What can we do in the States? What can we do where we're so far away? We can always do something. We can give up a meal a week going out and donate it to an organization. We can go on Instagram or Facebook or LinkedIn or other social media, and we can comment and show empathy or compassion for the people that are there. Because the more people comment on posts, the more it escalates the post and the more that others are aware of the work that that nonprofit is doing. Mm -hmm. So those are all really helpful things, but you don't even have to leave your seat, mm -hmm. right? When we purchase something, maybe we could think, wow, that could be something a refugee can use. And even if I send 10 ponytail holders to the border, that's 10 more than what they have. I don't yeah. need to send 20,000 to make a difference. Yeah. And also you were speaking about, you know, misinformation that these refugees may have or reality that they face when they come to America or on the chance that they, you know, get the asylum that they, that they are seeking. But what about the misinformation that, you see a lot of people here in America project onto these individuals. How can we as people living in America, you know, consume media in a responsible manner that we are being informed of these individual situations 
and that we can extend this compassion towards them. Is there any responsible media sites or news sources that you think that people should gravitate towards when gathering information about refugees? Because like you said, you know, you see these people spewing hateful comments on pages, but do you think that these individuals just aren't receiving maybe accurate media information about the situation? I think, well, first of all, you can Google good media choices and there's a grid that comes up that says it shows like accuracy versus left to the right. Mm -hmm. And so you can decide where you want your media to come from. You know, organizations like NPR are pretty high at the top. Um, So it actually has like this grid that tells you, you know, when you look at a media source, how, how trustworthy are they? So I would argue if you're reading a story, look at the trustworthiness. You know, if you're just sharing a post, look at the source, because that source may not be a credible source for that information. There's a lot of misinformation. There are bad people everywhere. There are bad refugees. There are bad Americans. There are bad people in America, right, Mm -hmm. that were born and raised here. There will always be people that are going to take advantage. Mm -hmm. And we cannot let that jade us from the people that really need help. Because if we focus on those that take advantage, then we lose sight of those that really need the help. And what we need to do is focus on those that need the help. And all it takes is just digging a little deeper and looking around. And again, I think it comes down to compassion and recognizing that if it was you, if it was me, if it was us, would we want someone to help us? And if we were fleeing a situation where we felt like our lives were in danger and we had nowhere to go, what would we do and what would we want someone to do for us? And that answer is then what we should do. And we can't all change the world, right? So we just, we have to do the little bit that each of us can do. And each of us did a little bit. Imagine if each one of us in the United States gave $20. That's it. Yeah. We probably could solve so many things, right? Mm-hmm. And I, but I will say the United States is the most philanthropic country in the world, in my opinion. You know, people are extremely generous. I am blown away by the generosity of our donors. And so it's our responsibility at organizations like Mission de Caridad to put those donations to work, to do the work that the people cause us to do, that pay, pay us to do. And so I'll tell you a few things. One, I don't get paid for what I do. I am mm. a volunteer at Mission de Caridad. I pay for all of my own travel. I pay for all of my own expenses. And I am probably the second highest donor in the organization, if not the first, Mm -hmm. right? So I put my money where my mouth is and it's a sacrifice for me. Trust me. There's a lot of things that I could do. I don't go on vacation. Mexico is not a vacation. It's a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Um, And it's not that my family has never been on vacation, but you know, we choose to spend our money in this way. I'm not suggesting that everybody does it. I'm sharing this information because It tells you it's an organization that you can trust. It's an organization where a leader is not taking a huge salary. A leader is willing to sacrifice for the organization. Then the organization must be doing good for the people. Mm -hmm. And finally, is there any, are there any closing remarks that you want to leave our listeners with anything about yourself, about the organization? There is nothing more gratifying than serving another. There's something about serving another person that helps you to see things that maybe you wouldn't see another way. When you serve together as a family, when you serve alongside other people, it's something about giving other people joy that brings us joy. And I want that for everybody. I want everybody to have that feeling of lifting somebody else up because it feels great to do that. And I also want people to know that every little bit counts. And that no matter what you have to give, I had someone once that donated, I think he donated $10, Mm -hmm. but for him, $10 was a ton of money. So I took that donation as being multiple thousands, right? Because in my mind, that's the value of that donation to him. And $10 can buy stuff, Mm -hmm. you know, it can buy many things. And so I think from that standpoint, people feeling like they can make a difference and that they can and that they should find organizations that they can trust, that don't just not give because they don't know where to give. Do some research because there are good organizations. It doesn't have to be Mission de Caridad. It can be another organization. There are so many of us, but know where your money is going and feel good that your money is being put to good use. 
And I would encourage people, sometimes the largest organizations aren't necessarily the ones that are always at their feet on the ground. Mm -hmm. And that may be looking at smaller organizations that really do have their feet on the ground um, makes a big difference in putting your money to work. After speaking with Jean and learning about Mission de Caridad, I really had two large realizations. One, that on a personal level, I was really dedicated to learning more and helping in any way that I could with the asylum and refugee crisis occurring not just in our country, but throughout the world. And that number two, the refugee and asylum crisis occurring today is not a conflict that's too far from home. It's a dynamic conflict that's changing every day. And as cheesy as it sounds, I think it's our job to make sure that the change is for the better. That was Isha Hegde talking with Jean Sicarella of Misión de Caridad. If you liked this episode, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review us in the comments below. If you'd like to get in touch with us, email us at seekingrefugepodcast at gmail.com. Follow us at Refuge Podcast on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook for all the updates on our show. As always, a huge thank you to Maxi International House for making our show possible. Thank you so much for listening. And we'll see you in the next one.